When I decided to tell this story about Neville, I decided to use my middle name, which is Ammons, as my mother's maiden name. My authority rests on the fact that I spent Neville's last day with him. As you all know, Mrs. Goddard was quite ill, and she was in the hospital. So Neville, as far as I can figure, knew exactly that he was going, because he left two documents. One is a formal document, and the other is a handwritten note. Now, what had happened was that three years before he departed, I had the vision of his death as Judas. At the time, I didn't know what it was. I saw Neville in front of a restaurant, and I started to speak to him. And suddenly, he choked, and he fell back. And when he fell on the sidewalk, he spilled all of his bowels. Well, the dream was so grisly that I simply couldn't tell him. And yet at that time, he was saying from the platform, I love to hear that you have seen me die. Well, I kept hearing him say this, but I still could not bring myself to tell him this awful dream which I'd had. So one night, I was leafing through scripture, and suddenly, my eye fell on this passage in the first chapter of Acts. This is the description of Judas. Peter is speaking. Can you can everyone hear? Yeah. You oh. speak a little louder. Okay, a little louder. right. <clears throat> we'll wait until <clears throat> Thank you. I was going through scripture and my eye fell on the description of the death of Judas in the first chapter of Acts. Now, Peter is speaking here. He's describing Judas, who was numbered among them in the ministry. And he says, Now this man, with the reward of his iniquity, purchased a field, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Well, I was so excited, I could hardly wait to tell Neville. But it was too late at night, so I practically sat up all night. And when I figured that it was a decent hour in the morning, I got on the phone, and I got Mrs. Goddard on the phone too, because I wanted her to hear this. And I told him, I said, Neville, you are Judas. And he said, yes. Judas betrayed the messianic secrets. And then he said, you know that there are two traditions of the death of Judas. One is in the gospel account where he goes and hangs himself. The other is this account, which I just got through telling you, how he, he bursts asunder in the midst and all of his bowels gush out. And then he went on to say, In the Orient, suicide is a very honorable thing. The one who commits suicide in the Orient disembowels himself. And then he repeated once more, Judas betrayed the Messianic secret. Now, just in case there should be someone here who did not hear him toward the last, I want to mention 
that his truly great experience was the discovery that he is the father of David. And he told all of us that we are to have the same experience. We are going to awaken as God the Father. Now, what I'm telling today would have no purpose, it would make no sense whatsoever, if it were not for the fact that every lecture, Neville said, I am not speculating, I am not theorizing, I have awakened as God the Father, and every one of you is going to have this experience. So, that laid the groundwork. Then that last day, we were going to a dinner party, a very early dinner party. And I literally spent the whole day with Neville. I'm positive I'm the last one who saw him here. So I went to his home to pick him up. And he was so happy because he felt that Mrs. Goddard would soon really be well. And she was coming back from the hospital. But now Neville was so anxious not to disappoint his hostess that he left Mrs. Goddard in the hospital one day longer so he could go to this dinner party. Now, I know in retrospect that he left her in the hospital because he did not want her to see his body. So on the way to the hospital, <coughs> I told him about a dream I had had the night before and I had awakened with great, great anxiety. And he said to me, <coughs> it's wonderful that the depths of your being have given you a warning. Now, I know now that the anxiety I awoke with was my inner self telling me in advance of what was about to happen. So we went to the hospital, and I went downtown <coughs> to, excuse me, to do a few errands. And when I came back, I told him about my trip downtown. I said it was so hot, terribly hot. But it made me think, here we are, deep, deep in the heart of woodland, which was Blake's term for this earth, the furnaces here on this earth. And he said, yes, we are in woodland. And there are those who believe that no one ever returns from it. And I said, do you see those who haven't come in? And he said, yes, I see them. And I said, you see those who have come out? And he said, yes, I see those. And I said, then you see all three. He said, yes, I do. And those who have come out, who have returned to eternity, are the most exalted beings you could ever imagine. When we arrived at the party, the first thing we wanted was a martini. So... I got mine, and he got his, and then he gave me the first piece of bread and cheese. He said, here, Frank, take this. So I took it. And then just before we ate, my hostess asked me if I would like to have another martini. I said, certainly. And Neville said, wait, here, Frank. Take this. And he took his unfinished martini and poured it into my glass. So I finished his drink. Now, I don't, I don't think I have to point out the parallel here between the Last Supper and what he was enacting there. Then after dinner, he suddenly stood up and he said, we're going. And with that, we left. When we got home to his place, both of us decided that we didn't care for anything else to drink that night. And after a brief conversation, I went home and retired early. But for some reason, I couldn't sleep. There was a dog howling outside my window. 
Well, the next morning the phone rang, <clears throat> and it was his daughter. She had come to get him to go pick up Mrs. Goddard. And she said, Frank, I think Daddy went during the night. Can you come over? I said, certainly, I'm on my way. So I rushed over, and when I got there, the body had already been sealed off. The authorities were there, the coroner, the, um, the county officials, and members of uh, the family of, of the daughter's friends. The coroner kept asking me what had happened. He said, was Mr. Goddard a heavy drinker? And his daughter said, well, he used to be, but not lately. And he asked me how much he had had to drink. And I told him, well, no more. And then I remembered that he had given me the last half of his martini. I said, well, he didn't have more. He didn't even have two. And I said, why are you asking me all these questions? And he said, we don't understand all the blood. And I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't seen the body. With that, he said, come with me. And he took me into the part of the house that was closed off. And there was Neville lying on his back in a rigid position with his arms stretched out like this, nude, with a napkin over his face. And the coroner said, we don't understand all the blood. See, and with that, he reached down and picked up the napkin and showed me. And there was the image which I had seen in my dream all those years before. A terrible, contorted expression on his face, as if he had choked to death. Now, that's what I saw in my dream. I saw him choke and then fall backward. And when he fell backward, his bowels gushed out. Now, naturally, when he died here on earth, his bowels didn't gush out. His blood gushed out. The coroner said, apparently, he shed every drop of blood in his body. And with that, he put the napkin back over Neville's face. And then, before we left, he said, we don't understand all the blood, see? And once more, he reached down and picked the napkin up so I could see the face. So I knew in that instant, in a way that I could not understand, a way that I could not prove, that I was actually seeing scripture, which was written 2,000 years ago, made history. Because he had already told his group that he was Judas. I think some of you may remember the lecture some years ago when he talked about the dream which one of the members of the audience had had about his death as Judas. And at that time, he explained that Judah is the great revealer. Because the word Judah comes from Yod, which in Hebrew is the word for hand. I didn't know how to begin, what to do, where I would go from there. I certainly had no proof. There was no one I could tell. I did tell a few people. Something told me to tell the two men in the family of Neville's daughter's friend who had cleaned up his blood. Something told me to tell them that I had seen him die this way some years ago. So that it was on record, so to speak. The following week, I was in his home. And I happened to go near his armchair where he spent so much of his time. And there, beside his armchair, was a note. The note read, Isaiah 53, first verse. 
who hath believed our report. Following that were the words, This is my true experience of the Last Supper. Judas betrayed the Messianic secret. Following that, in Scripture, Amos chapter 8, verse 11. <clears throat> Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. It will not be a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God. Following that, the scripture from Isaiah 22, 22nd verse to the 25th verse. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And then to paraphrase the rest, describes the hanging <coughs> of the burden of the vessels of the father's house on this nail. And then the nail is cut off and the burden falls. Now this note I found on Thursday. Well, when I saw that note, it was as if I had gotten a telegram from eternity, because I knew that this was his way of letting me know that he knew that his death was going to fulfill scripture. But I still didn't know what to do with it. Then, some weeks later, I was able to see the document which he wrote as a lead-in to resurrection, which, as you know, is his great, great statement on his experience. He describes all of his experiences from the birth to the appearance of David to the uh, splitting of the temple and then finally the benediction of the dove. Well, he had told us that he wanted to write a lead-in to resurrection, something that would help prepare the reader for what was coming. I can't quote the whole thing. I started to read it to you, but I think really it's too long, so I will tell you the gist of it. He says that what happened to him goes beyond any reasonable thing. It was all revelation. That he knew that anyone hearing this story if they were, or rather, if he were in their place, he would think, well, poor Neville, he must have had a very hard time on it. Then he goes on to, to make the assertion that Jesus is the I am of every man in this world, and his son, the Christ, is David. Then he says, until I got this down on paper, I didn't feel that I had accomplished the work which I was sent to do. Then he goes on to say, I now present my two witnesses, the internal witness of my experience, and the external witness of Scripture. So between the lines, he is telling us that he knew perfectly well that he was sent into this world by the Elohim, that is to say the brothers, the compound unity, which is God, sent here to the characters in the play to let them know the means by which they were to depart from this play. A few days 
before our dinner party, I called him to tell him that I was having a very, very high experience. I couldn't account for it, but that my consciousness was going higher and higher and higher. And I said, Neville, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt some kind of authority is going to be given to me. I don't understand it. I certainly didn't earn it. With that, he broke in and he said, no, it's all a gift. It's all grace. And I said, well, that's my story. And he said, you want to hear my story? I said, yes. He said, Mrs. Murphy went off to Lourdes to see the holy relics. And while she was there, she saw the braces and she saw the crutches. And when she was coming back through customs, the customs inspector said, Mrs. Murphy, do you have anything to declare? And she said, uh, why no? And he said, well, do you mind if I open your suitcase just the same? And she said, why no, help yourself. So he opened the suitcase and looked around and he found a bottle. And he said, what is this, Mrs. Murphy? She said, why, I've been to Lourdes to see the holy relics, and I brought back a bottle of holy water. He said, do you mind if I inspect it? And she said, no, no, by all means. So he opened it. He sniffed at it. He tasted it. He said, Mrs. Murphy, this is not a bottle of water. This is a bottle of scotch. And she said, down on your knees, man, and pray to the Holy Father. It's another miracle. <laughs> so I'm sure you're not surprised <clears throat> that he announced his coming demise in the form of a joke. I didn't get it. I laughed at it. I thought it was funny, but I didn't get it until someone said, don't you see the first words went to Lourdes to see the relics? I thought, well, that's right. There aren't any relics in Lourdes. Relics in the sense of remains. You simply have the, the crutches and the braces and what have you. So there can be no question of doubt that he knew exactly what was coming. He had enough control, as I see it, that he was able to arrange his wife's not finding his body, because that would have been a terrible blow to her. If she had seen what I saw, it would have set her back terribly. Now, are there any questions? Yes. Do you intend to continue uh, some of that will work in? I, I feel that I must tell what I have found. Um, what I just got through telling you was the key to the discovery in Scripture that Neville's name, both Neville and Goddard appear in the form of Hebrew and Greek words. And they don't just appear, they appear in the very passages which have to do with his experience. So this is what I feel I must tell. Because I feel that the people who supported Neville have a right to hear this story. Is that what you mean, Harriet? Yes. I'm here for four Sundays. Those of you who got an announcement, of course, know. After that, I don't know. I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. I was in a state of shock for about a year. And especially when I began finding these things in Scripture, I, I simply didn't know what to do with it. Actually, I secretly hoped that it would go away. But it didn't go away. 
So, here I am. The last place I ever thought I would be. No. I don't feel commissioned to teach. I, he, he said it all. He, uh, especially the law, that's not my, uh, I'm not qualified. Yes, well, that is my purpose in, in holding these sessions. If there is a genuine response after these four, then I intend to go on. Yes. Any more questions? Well, if not, then thank you for coming. I'm sorry that it was held up, but I wanted to make sure that everyone uh, got here since I lost my room. But what a game. Thank you.